Kapow, kaboom, good evening, good evening, we're back, we're back, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. Welcome to this week's episode of Live with Littlewood. The weather's been pretty dismal today, the dark nights are looming, but I'm hoping we can bring you some illumination and intellectual sustenance over the next 90 minutes or so. And as ever, we've got a fantastic lineup of guests to give you just that. So let me tell you what's coming up on tonight's show. Manchester, a city united, uh, potentially a city united against the government. The tier three restrictions imposed on Greater Manchester kick in in, as I'm speaking to you now, six hours time. It was announced this afternoon that after talks with ministers, South Yorkshire will also move into tier three from Saturday. Will other areas of the North follow suit? Are other cities destined to lock horns with the government? What do we make of what the mayor of Manchester's been doing in terms of his fight back, Andy Burnham? Is he the last standing liberal in Britain? I'm going to be asking our guests. Heading west from there. Is a circuit break the right solution for Wales or a fire break? I've lost track of all these analogous terms now. We're going to hear from an academic who questions the wisdom of the Welsh lockdown. And also tonight, we're back again on Brexit. Uh, deal or no deal? Uh, we can't seem to do a deal with Andy Burnham very easily, so God only knows what our chances are of doing a deal with Michel Barnier in the EU. So brinksmanship between Brussels and Britain continues. Is a Brexit trade deal of any sort likely? If it's a no deal, what will the implications of that be? How bad is that? And we're also going to ask within the Brexit issue, why are the UK's bishops getting hot under the dog collar about Brexit? Uh, they intervened this week um, on the Brexit matter, particularly with regard to the House of Lords vote. Uh, what would Jesus have made of the internal markets bill, we're going to ask ourselves. And we're going to finish up with Generation Y, or kind of Generation Y bother. A new report suggests millennials around the world are dissatisfied with democracy. Uh, they're not alone, I suspect. A survey of 5 million people in their 20s and 30s shows they have less faith in democratic institutions than their parents or grandparents did when they were the same age. Is this disconnect a danger to the free society? Does it provide fertile ground for populist policies? All that and more coming up in the next hour and a half or so. And as I've promised, as ever, I'll be joined by a brilliant cast of commentators, journalists, academics, think tankers and more. Coming up later on the programme, I'll be joined by Ali Redison, the head of Europe and trade policy at the Institute of Directors. William Clouston, the leader of the ongoing Social Democratic Party. I'll also be joined by the Deputy Director of the Adam Smith Institute, Matt Kilcoyne, Professor Brian Morgan, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Cardiff Metropolitan University and a member of the Regulatory Policy Committee. Cindy Yu, China reporter and broadcast editor at The Spectator, and from home team IEA, our Head of Public Affairs, Emma Revel. And before I introduce our first two guests, I want to let you know I'm doing my own bit to try and bring about a V-shaped recovery. With 100 quid of my own cash, I'm running a quiz and a prize on this edition of Live with Littlewood. I want you to be clear, it's my own cash. I can also tell you that the terms and conditions God, the amount of red tape and paperwork about this is something quite miraculous on how you can enter and all of the liabilities. They're in the show notes on YouTube. And you're going to need three things in order to win £100. You're going to need to know the email address to email your answer to. 
and that will be coming up on YouTube just about now. So that's at the top of the show. About halfway through the show, I'm actually going to ask you the question. So you're going to have to answer the question. And it's very difficult. I'm pretty confident the 100 quid is going to stay in my pocket. And then towards the end of the show, I will tell you the subject heading that you need to put in the email to enter. So there's three bits, and they'll be coming up throughout the show. Um, but the email address, you can see it on the screen. Um, uh, I think it's been broadcast on YouTube now, is lwl at iea.org.uk. Take a note of that. That's the email address that you will have to email. On to my first two guests. Delighted to welcome back to the show my friend Tim Montgomery, the founder of the Conservative Home blog, the news website Unheard. He co-founded the Centre for Social Justice Think Tank. He is a serial, a serial entrepreneur in the public policy space. He is also a devout fan of Manchester United Football Club. A very, very good evening to you, Tim. Very good evening to you, Mark. Thanks for having me again. Great to have you, Tim. And joining me throughout the show is the IEA's very own Stephen Davis, our uh, head of education here at the IEA. He is joining us from his tier three bunker in Manchester itself. A uh, warm welcome back to one of the home team. And in terms of the divides within our country, he, he represents the blue half of Manchester, a Manchester City fan. So good evening to you, Steve. Good evening. So, gentlemen, Tim, I'm going to start with you. What do we make of the rollout of these localised restrictions and lockdowns from, from two uh, perspectives, really? Uh, one is a question of, are they going to do the remotest amount of good? Is this the way to beat the virus, protect the NHS, save lives and all of the rest of it. Uh, tier three restrictions on Greater Manchester. Uh, more, more northern areas may well be following suit. West Yorkshire, Teesside, maybe Nottingham on a collision course with the government. It's also recently announced South Yorkshire's going in. Um, but the second thing is who should make the decisions here? We've, uh, uh, you might argue that in the context of a national pandemic, we want centralised government to make the decisions. There's all sorts of overspill effects. Uh, but are we finding that uh, mayors and local governments are little more than lobbyists, really. I mean, they're trying to get the central government to act or not act in a particular fashion. Tim, what do you make of it, this government's approach to uh, winning wave two? Well, I think the government has a problem with its backbenches in that you know, a large part of the Parliamentary Conservative Party opposed, in my view correctly, another national lockdown. And so I think the government decided that it was probably easier to impose local lockdowns on various places where track and trace system were revealing the rates of infection were relatively higher. But what we've learned is that these local areas, rather than doing as government thought they would do and just take a little bit of money and be, in, uh, and be very compliant, have actually been pretty rebellious and are pretty determined to defend their patch. Now, in the short term, I think that's you know a political difficulty. It's a difficulty for the COVID crisis. But in the long term, for something I don't know whether you would support, Mark, I'm certainly um, hopeful for, that we actually have a more resilient and robust system of local administration in our country, whereby all the power isn't centralised in Whitehall. It's a good thing. And to be honest, I'm... I think Andy um, Burnham has gone a little bit too much into the amateur dramatics department in the last day or two. But overall, I think he has said, um, you are asking me to implement measures that probably won't do much to stop COVID, that will damage many of Manchester's businesses. And if you're going to do that, you've got to give me a certain amount of money so that I can compensate these businesses. Mm. And I think he's represented Manchester pretty well on, on that front. I think when the difference, as I think it was yesterday, was only £5 million, I think he perhaps could have been a little bit more cooperative. But his general um, approach to this, I think, has been one most Democrats should support. Here you go. I'm going to bring the city of Manchester together, uh, a conservative-leaning Manchester United fan, a classical liberal-leaning uh, city fan, to agree that Andy Burnham is the last great hope of liberalism and freedom <laughs> in the UK, right? Steve, do you I share that be, analysis? And I the 65 million goal. quid, I mean, that wouldn't even buy you a substitute left back, yeah. <laughs> let alone, <laughs> let alone uh, restore the economic health of the city of Manchester, right? Do you agree with Tim's get... analysis, though? 
I agree pretty much with what uh, Tim said there. I mean, five million wouldn't even get Stockport County a left back. Never mind one of the two big teams in Manchester. Um, I mean, quite honestly, I, I think the government has just given us a masterclass in how not to do political communication. Because, you know, when you consider the amount of money that, to use the Prime Minister's own chosen word, has been spaffed away on various things right now, five million really is neither here nor there. And as Tim says, the point is this. I think it is quite right that decisions like this are made at the national level because of the, the nature of an illness. It doesn't observe political boundaries. But if you're going to impose differential costs upon other parts of the country from the national level, it seems perfectly appropriate that those national areas should get uh, a higher level assistance than other places are getting in order to allow for the uh, side effects of that. So that seems perfectly reasonable to me. Uh, and I think the government's just handled this really badly from a purely political point of view, quite apart from what you think of their strategy. And, and Steve, what do you think they're about? It might be that all three of us are going to agree on the heroics of Andy Burnham uh, and also on what devolution should look like. But here's my worry about how we, Steve, have, have handled devolution so far. But if you like, all of the big decisions and the big spending decisions are made still by central government. Yeah. So Andy Burnham has to go and do his best to get X million pounds out of central government. He doesn't actually have the levers himself to sort yeah. of say, well, actually, I'm going to leave pubs open. And uh, that's all right, because, you know, I've got a good health policy here in Manchester that will cope with that. Or, uh, you know, we're actually going to bail out these businesses in Manchester and therefore the Manchester business rates that I fully control will go up in order to do so. Yeah. It's still all, even though you've created these mayors and all sorts of local authorities, it's still, they, they basically end up being lobbyists in Westminster or to Westminster, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the fundamental problem is you can't have administrative or political decentralisation, but fiscal centralism. And that's always been the problem with British local government. It does not have an adequate and clearly identified tax base that it controls itself and which it can be held accountable for the way it uses and the rate at which it levies it. And so we can be like Switzerland, if you like, or we could be like France. What you can't be is a mixture of the two, which is what we're getting. That's the worst of both worlds, really. Tim, what's the overall optimal, think out of the box, think the unthinkable, say the unsayable devolution package that you'd like to see, even accepting that obviously in a national pandemic that there might be more centralisation than normal, but should Andy Burnham control healthcare policy, social care policy and tax rates in Manchester? Well, I think there is actually, the, I think in the North West, there is actually quite a level of devolution of um, health and social care policy. That was one experiment that emerged from the George Osborne period. But my goodness, there is way too much agreement taking place um, on this podcast. Um, I certainly agree with what, um, in the Zoom call, um, with what um, Steve has said. How much you can uh, devolve fiscally, um, there was, it will still always be messy. Because I think the way we are in the UK, there is a commitment to a certain level of equity across the UK. And so there would have to be significant transfers from wealthier parts of the UK. And that often means London, you know, to, uh, to poorer parts of, of the UK. So it's always going to be complicated. And I think even if you had large scale fiscal devolution in operation now, at a crisis point like this, there would still be a discussion of that needing to be topped up to cope with the level of crisis. So hmm. it would probably be almost unavoidable that you would still get into some kind of negotiations, but they would be less uh, consequential in terms of their outcome for local people. Well, look, this is brilliant. We've sorted out the British Constitution, but let's actually try and sort out the appropriate public policy response. Um, Tim, what do you make of the government's basic response? Is the you know has it been too fast, too slow, too draconian, wrong-headed? Uh, are we actually handling this unfolding COVID nineteen crisis well, badly, or somewhere in between? Very badly. Um, and I think if you want to really understand why the government is doing what it's doing, I think you have to look at the first um, wave of this and its response to the lockdown. Um, it acted too slowly, I think, then, because then we did not know exactly what COVID was. It could have been more like the bubonic plague and uh, a rapid lockdown probably was the right response. And they didn't do that. And then we had the death toll that we did. And I think now all the politics for the government point one way. And that's if there is another big uh, 
uh, uptick in COVID deaths, they will pay a very political, heavy political price for getting it wrong twice. I am sure they know, as we know, that actually the cost of keeping that um, surge down in terms of greater mental health problems, failure to diagnose early enough cancer and heart disease, and um, the unemployment ec- epidemic is going to be an awful lot more substantial in the long run than anything that happens on COVID. But I'm afraid all the politics points in one direction, all the politics points that they control the short term danger to their political position much more than the long-term risks. And I'm afraid I'm afraid I perhaps people think I'm being very cynical, but that is, I think, how they are thinking in number 10. This is extraordinary though, because Tim, I'm not saying you're wrong, but if all of the politics points in that direction, then our politics is somewhat seriously detached from reality, right? So, I mean, let let me just fire a few numbers at you. This won't be the, the whole picture and I'd welcome your thoughts and then Steve's in this. Diabetes deaths are up by 86% in six months. Prostate cancer up by 53%. Parkinson's 79%. Breast cancer 47%. Bowel cancer 46%. In England, 100 extra extra deaths are occurring every day from non-COVID illness, presumably because people can't access the NHS as easily or it's difficult to do so. 350,000 cancer referrals have been missed. 27 million fewer GP appointments between March and August than the same period last year. COVID is the seventh leading cause of deaths at home for men and 11th for women. 80% of fatalities are among people over 70. ONS said deaths are 1.5% above the five-year average, but tracking on a normal trajectory for this time of year. So why why aren't our politics listening to these sort of numbers, Tim? I mean, what what's the yeah. thought process that just seems to be, I appreciate these are just a few stats, but it seems to be out with the science. We'll spend an infinite amount of money to stop a COVID death, but thousands of people might die of other ailments as a consequence. And why are we hearing these numbers on Live with Littlewood, but not on the BBC Today programme or the BBC Six O'Clock News? You know, you're getting COVID death statistics announced by Hugh Edwards at six o'clock but they're not put in any kind of context and if Mm. um, our public service broadcaster in inverted commas can't provide that service to its uh, viewers and listeners then you know it's falling down and I think there will need to be all sorts of inquiries into this uh, episode in our nation's history but I really hope the broadcasters and the media are really have a bit of self-examination and outside examination too, because they haven't been held to account for their own role in not broadcasting those kinds of statistics. Now, of course, it isn't entirely simple. If the NHS is overwhelmed by COVID, it wouldn't be able to treat, you know, any of those sorts of problems. It's it's not a simple choice of treating COVID or treating those other things. But has there been enough reorganisation of the NHS so that there are parts of the service that can actually, you know, focus in different ways on home visits or whatever, um, so that the uh, so that the some of the uh, more uh, uh, common uh, long-standing complaints can also be dealt with. There just doesn't seem to have been that level of uh, flexibility in in the service that I think we have seen in countries like Germany, which yeah. haven't had the same fall off um, in treats in in rates of treatment of of inverse commas normal diseases. Steve, what's your take on it? Uh, is yeah. Tim right that these are the politics and are the politics mad, even just looking at it from a public health lens, right? Even if you were to say, to hell with the economy, you know, we're only going to focus on health outcomes. It seems to me there's a trade-off within health outcomes. Yeah. And if our aim is actually to maximise the longevity of human life, etc., then we're, we're over-egging the, the COVID problem, aren't we? Because these other things are getting worse and worse and worse. Well, uh, as Tim said, it's a complicated problem, but also I think the real problem, which again has not received as much attention as it needs to, is that they can't really make a more sensible trade-off, quite apart from the political incentives they face. Uh, First of all, the big failure of the government is that it hasn't, still hasn't got a really effective test, trace and isolate program in place. And basically no policy to deal with COVID is going to work unless you have that. 
And the only way you can really mitigate the demands that COVID is putting on so that the NHS can get on with dealing with the other things it has to deal with all the time anyway, is if you have an effective TTI programme. And one of the reasons for having the lockdown in the spring, apart from all the talk about suppressing this rate of spread, was to try and get time to introduce an effective TTI programme, which we haven't done. So we're now left with it. The other thing is this reveals the institutional problem of the NHS, which is this it's like a huge juggernaut a massive you know ocean tanker and trying to turn it round and adjust it is incredibly difficult almost impossible and tim mentioned germany the point about germany is that the health system there is extremely decentralized compared to ours it's run largely at the lander or even the chrysler level and so as a result it's much more flexible much more readily adaptable to a crisis particularly one like this where you have very wide variation between different parts of the country, uh, which is why I think a national lockdown is a bad idea, certainly, but where you do need some kind of variation in, in the kind of way you adapt in different areas. But we just can't do that very easily because we don't have the necessary tools. So we're in a really bad place right now, actually. Tim and Steve, stay with us. Uh, I want to bring on uh, two new guests to consider the, the lockdown uh, approach of the government and particularly to consider um, what's going on in Wales from the point of view of one of our guests. Uh, so it's a warm welcome, first time on the show to Brian Morgan, Professor of Entrepreneurship at Cardiff Metropolitan University. He's also a member of the Regulatory Policy Committee. He's been Senior Economic Advisor at the Department of Trade and Industry and Chief Economist at the Welsh Development <coughs> Agency. And William Clouston is the leader of the Social Democratic Party, became leader in 2018, was re-elected <coughs> in March 2020 of this year, originally joined the SDP all the way back in 1982, when the SDP, I think, was only a year old holds a first and master's degree in urban planning and property management and read philosophy at Durham University at um, postgraduate level. A very, very, very good evening to the two of you. Good evening, Brian. Lovely to see you. Lovely to have you on the programme. Good evening, Mark. And a very good evening to you as well, William. Great, great to uh, have you with us. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Good to be um, here. Um, Brian, can I can I start with you? I'm going to ask all of. I'm, I'm interested in the specifics of what's going on in Wales. Tim was saying we don't always get the uh, the full picture broadcast to us here in this bubble of Westminster, but I think oftentimes Wales is somewhat overlooked. So just to talk through my understanding of what's happened there, this this firebreaker will be introduced in Wales from 6 p.m. on Friday. It will last until November the 9th. Everyone will, in Wales will be required to stay at home, work from home wherever possible. The only exceptions being critical workers and jobs where working from home is simply not possible. All non-essential retail, leisure, hospitality and tourism businesses closed. One person in Wales died with COVID yesterday. It's been averaging about three per day in the last week. And the Welsh Government has announced a new £300 million package of support for businesses affected by the shutdown on the top of the £80 million announced last week. I hope I've got the facts right, Brian, but please correct me on any of them if I haven't. What do you make of this as a policy to beat the disease, Brian? Well, I think in general, if I can make a sort of general statement, first of all, Mark, is you know, that the problem with this debate, especially around lockdown, either total lockdowns or the three-tiered system, is that instead of accepting that there are unknowns and uncertainties out there, we've been confronted with people on from both sides who are currently certain of their views, really, uh, on the best way forward. You know, there's either lockdown is absolutely necessary and therefore all lockdown sceptics are granny killers or sort of lockdown is completely um, pointless and therefore lockdown advocates are simply hysterical. So let's go for herd immunity. Now, um, in Wales, we've introduced this lockdown. Now, we know we've, we've, we've sort of um, known a lot more about it, as we mentioned earlier on. This, we know a lot more about the lockdown now and it doesn't seem right to me that almost eight months after the first lockdown, we're doing exactly the same as we did back in March. Um, and, and we know a lot more about it. We know who's been impacted. And of course, as you've said, death rates are falling. And of course, the average age of death is about 82. Um, now, in Wales, we've, we've had a government like in, like in the UK that is following, the, um, is following the, the science. And they've recently said that they're going to introduce this lockdown based on the evidence from TAC, the technical advisory cell that advises the Welsh government. Now, 
they've written a report, in fact, which is which is reasonably balanced. They don't just say we need a two week lockdown. They do think it's essential, but they also say that there's huge uncertainties out there and they're not too convinced about the need for the lockdown. And they actually come up with some interesting points. You know, they say both intervening and not intervening at this level will cause harm, either if you do bring in a lockdown or you don't. But from an economic perspective, preventing transmission is less important than maintaining an effective workforce. So limiting the size of the recession, they say, will save lives in the future, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they sort of got this balanced approach, which I find is very, very good, actually. But as I say, I'm not too sure about their conclusion that, um, you know, we need another lockdown exactly as we did back in March, as if we've not learned anything. And, um, you know, the current one that you mentioned there, it sounded as if, you know, the Welsh government um, had brought in something you know, completely coherent. In fact, it's, it's rather inconsistent. For example, initially they said maintenance construction um, was going to be banned, uh, but today they've announced it's going to be unbanned. We still don't know which businesses are going to be closed, and um, we don't know how the hospitality sector is going to be organised, sure. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there's lots of uncertainties out there. The worst governments come down in favour of this lockdown, but the actual evidence presented to them was, was quite nuanced, you know. It's going to be a huge yep. impact on the economy. Um, so we've got to get it right. And I don't think a total lockdown gets it right. I think because we didn't know so much about it in the initial uh, cases back in March, a lockdown then was probably a good thing, as many people have said already. On a precautionary basis. we, we, we more yeah, Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, William, let me bring you in. What's the what's the SDP sort of approach to this? Even sort of very free market liberal people such as myself accept that this is the sort of situation in which you need government action. There's a collective problem here. But what's your take on whether the government has not so much handled this right? I mean, politicians always make errors, but what the appropriate response is given the statistics in front of us given the threat posed by COVID-19 and given the various trade-offs between different types of healthcare that we need to get people and indeed the, the need to keep the economy moving forward if we possibly can. William. Um, well, I, our basic, I mean, initially in March, we supported the lockdown. I think yeah, as other guests would agree, uh, the precautionary principle was right. and we, You couldn't be an expert in the new virus and so on. Um, but then a three, three week lockdown became seven weeks. And, I'm, and gradually, I think we've, we've, we've come to the view that the government's failed in, in a very important respect, which is it's failed to create any sort of um, policy stability. So no one knows whether you're a household or a business or anyone else. No one really knows where they are. Uh, and I think they had an opportunity to do that if they'd uh, adopted a, 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 an approach a little bit more like Sweden, so um, put a little bit more responsibility on, on businesses and households and others to, to um, implement policies possibly pretty much in perpetuity. I mean, the, the four or five things that we talk about, uh, you know, shield, isolate, distance, you know, wash your hands and so on and masks, uh, that's here to stay. And, and what I think they've made a terrible error on is, is, is basically what I call stop go. Um, the idea that you can have one said you can bribe people to go to restaurants and pubs in the summer when for seasonality reasons it was probably fairly safe to do so fair enough but they the government generated over half a billion trips to pubs and restaurants and then suddenly slam on the brakes and 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 suddenly the stop go at the sharp turns uh ap approach um i think uh it displays a a, 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 a lack of reality probably and, and a lack I of understanding about how business works actually uh, and William do you also think the uh, you're right about the stop go so and, and and I think that's rather I've just found that rather personally sort of psychologically scarring you know even if you're in full lockdown if you can see the trajectories moving in the right direction you put up with a lot this is a bit like having a relapse right you yeah. know so uh, um, but what about the clarity of the rules I mean I literally I can't get my head around them. I'm, you know, I'm basically trying to be compliant, yeah. but it's extremely difficult to to know what you need to do to be compliant. You're allowed to go to a restaurant with uh, up to five people if it's uh, a working lunch, 
Mm. But I think the government guidance is that it needs to be a substantial meal. I don't know whether I've broken the law if I don't eat my greens. Um, And then you get all of these sort of, is it an essential trip? Is it a non-essential trip? Um, You know, is it important that you do this work from the office? Is it vital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it all seems to me to be extraordinarily subjective about what a work meeting is and what a a leisure meeting is we get these absurdities a friend of mine was saying that his his daughter works in the same office as uh, as a, a work colleague so they i mean socially distanced and all of that so they spend their same time in a fairly small office they can't go out to lunch together however no. well unless they discuss work at lunch and have a substantial meal i mean it's just incredibly confusing wouldn't you say it is. It's very, very confusing. And, and again, what they're not achieving is what they need to achieve, which is they need to get a sustainable approach that will go through this. I mean, this isn't... Remember, you know, there's eight or nine billion people in the world, and this is out there now. Um, there's a lot of debate about vaccines, <clears throat> on, but then some people uh, probably won't agree to take the vaccine. So this is here to stay for a long, long time. And, and, and the government, it's incumbent on the government to, to get a series of basic measures which people can understand and can keep uh, keep going with. And I think people are becoming exhausted, and I think that does explain why transmission uh, in the household sphere has, has increased, because people are just saying, well, I'm not going to bother with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, how can people know? I mean, I, I, it was a bus driver, a school bus driver kept in the Northeast, kept his, um, his uh, emails on this from government, the, the advice, and it ran into thousands. And it was no, yeah. practically, it's practically a full-time job trying to know where you stand. Yeah, uh, People in Wales are, uh, are equally confused. Uh, yeah. They have been a bit more um, straightforward in saying that everything is shut. You know, restaurants are shut, pubs are shut. Um, but in terms of what happens if you've already, um, if you're in the hospitality sector, you've already got clients in, You've got people who are booked in. You've got contracts to fulfil. They, yeah, um, yeah. as I say, they stopped maintenance construction yesterday. Then, then, then they they unbanned it today. You know, it, it's completely confusing. But one thing they've been absolutely sure about is that golf courses have to be closed. Right there, you go. So uh, there's one bit of clarity, Tim. I want to come back to to you. There, there is obviously a lot of confusion. I guess when you're in a grey area between sort of full lockdown and full liberty you're almost bound to get some anomalies, you know, I mean, why, why a rule of six, why not a rule of eight? Well, I guess you got, you draw a line somewhere. Um, but it is deeply, deeply confusing, isn't it, Tim? And I, I mean, my favourite Matt cartoon in the Telegraph recently, he's always, a, he's always a good laugh, Matt, but was a brilliant one with one chap saying to another while he was looking at his mobile phone, I've downloaded this brilliant NHS app. It tells you it tells you if you're within a hundred yards of anyone who can explain the rules. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, well, that would be a useful piece of technology. Uh, but Tim, do you think that, that it, confusion reigns, or is that just the nature of being in the kind of grey area, half locked and half not? And I want to put you a question uh, about the politics of it as well, Tim. So I've got two questions for you, and I'll ask Steve's take on this as well. Um, Andrew Lillico asks on the chat. At current rates of growth in deaths will have exceeded the total number of spring first wave deaths in this second wave by the middle of December on the present trajectory, Andrew says. What would be the political implications of that? And Tim, I wanted you to consider that, Tim, because you were referencing your starting point was the sort of politically possible rather than the scientifically logical. Tim. Yeah. Well, um, just picking up on something William said that was really important, I thought, just a few minutes ago as well. He talked about, you know, the stop-go nature of government policy. And actually what that um, what the economic data revealed, even after the huge sort of stimulus that the Chancellor put in place, the economic data was pretty poor. We weren't actually recovering from all of this as much as we'd hoped to. So I, I, it sort of adds to the general picture, really, that... Um, the idea that we are going to recover quickly from this once all this over it shouldn't be taken for granted and let's not keep relegating that topic um, in this discussion and um, i actually i'm not quite as cynical about or critical of the government on the rules clarity perhaps as you are mark it, it is difficult and i think it is difficult partly because the government is responding all the time to new information about this virus and it's sure. tweaking the rules appropriately and i think they would be criticized if they weren't tweaking the rules 
in response to new evidence, you know, as if they kept the rules absolutely um, consistent. And then and finally, on what Andrew Lillico says, well, that in a way is, I think, what I was saying about why the government is motivated in the, in the way that it is. It absolutely fears that the current trajectory that the uh, number of deaths is, is, is on is what could finish them a, as a government, which is why they are taking the measures um, that they are. But one thing I think we should have learned by now as we uh, enter the uh, X month of this crisis is that the trajectories of these, uh, you know, epidemic specialists, etc., have rarely proven to be a reliable forecast. They're more unreliable than economic forecasts and football transfer rumours. You know, they are some of the least trustworthy data you can have. And so um, I personally think that already some of the measures put in place will protect us from that. And I hope I hope I'm right. I think I think the numbers are, are very interesting, Mark. I mean, in Wales, they said that um, by bringing in this lockdown, we will save 750 deaths between now and the end of March next year. And they put 300 million into the pot to achieve that. Now, if you work that through, that's, and with all the other support as well that comes, comes with it, that's 500,000 pounds per life. Now the NHS, when it looks at, you know, the, the price of a life, yeah. it tends to put it somewhere around 40,000 pounds. Yeah, I, so, this is so interesting, Brian, because it's, uh, economists always sound completely inhumane when they talk about these sort of things, but they're decisions we've got to make, right? I mean, the, the, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence decides whether drugs come on the market or not. I think I'm right in saying that there was a new drug for asthma, which yeah. presumably have like, which has been stopped. It's just too expensive. And we seem to be pricing saving somebody from COVID at a much higher level ten than times, saving ten them in a road time. accident or, 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 or anything else. Steve, can I just come to, to you yeah. for your thoughts before we bring in some new guests on the uh, obscurity of the rules? And I'm wondering whether this is actually acting as a deterrent to human behaviour now as well. Um, a friend of mine was saying to me that uh, her, her mother wouldn't come to London, not because she was worried about the virus, not because she was some ultra libertarian who would refuse to wear a mask, but she was so concerned that she would make a misstep of some sort, not put her mask on at the right time, get shouted at for walking the wrong way around a pub, get on at the wrong door of a bus, not know the protocols. And therefore, it was just sort of easier and less stressful to stay at home. Jason Groves, political editor of the Daily Mail, sort of sums up some of the confusion here as well. Greater Manchester Tier 3 will see the standard closure of pubs, bookies, etc. Soft play centres will also close. I have no idea what a soft play centre is as opposed to a hard play centre. Uh, soft play centres will also close, as in Lancashire, but not Merseyside. But unlike Merseyside, gyms can stay open. And unlike Lancashire, it looks like car boot sales will still be allowed. Am I being unfair here? I mean, is this just the nature of, it, of, of, of complex and changing regulations, as Tim says? Or is there actually sort of the rule of law comes into disrepute if it's almost impossible to comply without, Brian was saying, you know, reading a thousand emails if you're a bus driver? Yes, I mean, well, what that actually shows you is that what's going on is a negotiation uh, between the local authorities and, and the government as to what exactly is applied in terms of rules. And that does undermine the rule of law. Uh, as excessive complexity also does. And maybe it's me, but I think the common reaction is not going to be people saying, oh, I'm afraid I might uh, break a rule so I won't do it. It's more common reaction, I suspect, is going to be, well, I'm just not going to observe any rules uh, if I don't know what they are. Uh, and I think that that actually in the longer run is much more damaging, both medically and in terms of, you know, respect for, uh, you know, rules or advice coming from, from the government. I would say... I think Andrew Lodico's figures at the moment are correct. Now, the question is whether or not that, I mean, the trend at the moment is very alarming. The question is whether or not it will actually continue. And obviously, as Tim says, we, we don't know for sure. But I, I fear certainly that in some places it is, because the really alarming sign is that the infection is starting to spread more rapidly amongst the over 50s and over 60s, which is the high risk group where you're more likely to get serious hospitalization. And if I could just say something else, I think the reason for this chaos is twofold. One is the simple fact of the complexity of the world it's very, very hard to produce simple rules for a really complex economy. And they're trying to micromanage it. But the other thing is that what I think the government 
desperately, desperately wants is to be able to go back to normal as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And what it has to realise, really, is that that's just not on the table. As William said, we are actually looking at something which is going to last for at least 18 months to two years, as I predicted back in the spring. And therefore, what the government should have done is to think, well, OK, we're in this for the long haul and explain that to the public. And I think that would have led them to a completely different approach. But as it is, they're frantically scratching around for something, anything, that will enable them to say, oh, we're back to these business as usual the way it was before. And that actually, paradoxically, has had the opposite effect of the one they want to achieve, of making it's actually made things worse. Well, look, we're off to a good start. We've pretty much solved the COVID problem in, in about half an hour, Tim, Brian, William and Stephen. Please, gentlemen, stay with us, but I want to move on to another topic I'm sure we can solve in about 20 minutes or so. Brexit, this should be easy to put to bed after uh, solving uh, coronavirus. And I'm going to invite two more guests to, to, to join us. So we're going to be covering deal or no deal. But I promise at the top of the show, you can make 100 quid. This is my personal contribution to supercharging the uh, economy. I'm going to give the terms and conditions are in the show notes below on YouTube. Um, you will need an email address to email your answer to. You will need the answer to the question I'm just about to give you. And then later on in the show, I'm going to give you the subject heading that you need to put in the subject line of the email. So you need those three different elements throughout the show. But here's the tricky one. Uh, a lot of economists think there's far too much mathematics in economics, especially those from the Austrian school uh, that I tend to have some sympathy with. But I'm going to ask you a mathematical question. Uh, but this was a question that was put to me in the pub quiz and the quiz master got the answer wrong. Um, the, uh, the, it's going to be about snooker. Um, and the email address you need to send it to was up earlier in the show. The subject title you need to use is too many reds. So when I give you the question later on in the show, you've got the email address, too many reds needs to be what's in the subject heading. And it's going to be a question about mathematics and snooker. And you'll get that towards the end of the show. So if you've born with us, you've got the email address, you've got the subject, too many reds is what you need to put in the email title. And the question will be coming up just a little bit later on in the show. We're now going to be joined by two more guests to consider the Brexit issue. Um, uh, Matt Kilcoyne, welcome back to the show to him. Uh, Matt's the direct, Deputy Director of the Adam Smith Institute, worked as a trade and political risks insurer in the City of London as an underwriter, also worked for the government of Catalonia as a trade and investment advisor. He's tweeted about the inconsistency of supporting a Welsh firebreaker while defending the people of Greater Manchester. And we're also joined for the first time on a show with, uh, by Ali Renison. Head of EU and Trade Policy at the Institute Directors, formerly Research Director at Business for Britain, has previously advised a number of parliamentarians <laughs> in both houses on EU legislative issues with a particular focus on trade and employment policy areas. A very good evening to you, Matt, and a very good evening to you, Ali. Um, I'm going to come to you guys in just a moment, but uh, I know Tim needs to leave us uh, shortly. So, Tim, deal or no deal, where do you think that we've got to here. Uh, it, I, I can't make head or tail of it. On the one hand, all the negotiations are off. On the other hand, we're told they're intensifying. I mean, pick a, pick a lane. Um, uh, does this show actually that the government taking a strong stance has brought the EU back to the table? Where the heck are we going to get to in all of this? Or are we going to trade on WTO terms uh, come the start of next year? Something that at the time of the referendum would have been considered pretty much the most extreme Brexit possible and certainly wasn't one that was seriously endeavoured by, uh, entertained by the mainstream leave side. Tim, what's your take? Um, well, Mark, I'm going to carry on the cynical explanation uh, theory for government actions that I offered you earlier. Uh, on COVID and um, sort of a, a year ago when we were talking about how uh, Team Boris negotiated uh, the nature of our withdrawal, oh. thus we were fighting for Britain, we were going to get whatever deal uh, you know was in our national interest first and foremost and then essentially Boris completely caved and accepted a solution to the Northern Ireland, Ireland problem that Theresa May had said no British Prime Minister would accept. And so I think we're going through a lot of theatre at the moment. I think the government is talking tough, 
so that it gets the likes of the Daily Express uh, cheering on. And then in the end, I think it will accept whatever the EU offers. And um, I think the EU knows that. And I think we will get pretty much um, what the EU is offering now and said that was all available at last week's um, summit. Blimey, Tim. Well, you've been a great ray of sunshine from Sally Salisbury. <laughs> um, it's true. Well, but, and, and you should be full of the joys of spring. Manchester United had a fantastic victory against Paris Saint-Germain last night yeah. with uh, uh, a brilliant goal and an even better own goal by Anthony Martial. Superb. But you, so you should be... You should, if this is you upbeat, Tim, blimey. What would have happened if Manchester United had lost? Um, but the, the, therefore, before at least, I... At least, say, at least I'm saying there's going to be a deal, Mark. Yeah, OK, 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 true enough, true enough. That would be considered upbeat in some quarters. Tim, I know you've got to leave us, but before you go, as you know, there's the highly market-sensitive Live with Littlewood economic optimism barometer uh, where you need to give me an integer between naught and 10, where naught is that in two to three years' time will be roughly the equivalent of North Korea. 10 is that we will be a bustling, trading, free and prosperous economy of your dreams. And the, as I say, the time period is two to three years. Where are you at on the highly market sensitive live with Littlewood barometer? Can you remember what I said last time? Was it seven or do you not have a record of all? I don't, uh... I don't keep a record. We don't demand any consistency from our guests, <laughs> Tim, least of all you. You can change your mind at will. I think I was seven, um, but continuing my um, ray of sunshine uh, role today, I'm definitely moving downwards, I think. So I would probably be six, I think. Uh, the uh, the prolongation of this crisis and the economic misery that it means it's going to be a longer term thing, as I think Steve was just arguing, than perhaps I'd expected. Six, not too bad then, Tim. And it will definitely be a top six finish for Manchester United this season as well. I hope you get back to see you again <laughs> soon. Tim, lovely to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Look forward to speaking to you soon. Uh, Ali and Matt, thank you for joining us. I hope the rest of our guests can stay with us. Uh, a very good evening to the two of you. Ali, welcome to the show. Uh, Brexit deal or no deal is what we're uh, talking about here. Where, what's your analysis, Ali, about where we're going to end up here? Is, has everything come to a crashing end and a conclusion? It's WT. TO terms or, or nothing, um, or is some sort of deal going to be put in place? What do you want to see happen and what do you think will happen, Ali? Well, first... Ooh, Blimey, we've lost her at the first breath. Uh, let's try and get Ali back online. Matt, I'll put the same question to you. Where do you think we've, we've got to in, in, in this, whole, uh, this whole situation? Are we heading for no deal? And if we are, should we worry about it particularly? Not really. I don't think we're heading towards no deal. I think the theatrics were priced in. Um, we had a bit of a game about um, our real deadline is, or our fate deadline is more real than your fate deadline. Um, the EU's fate deadline is coming at the end of this month. I expect that we may go beyond that, if only for a sort of a point scoring thing. And then uh, we've got a summit next month, which is likely to mean a deal. Every person that I know on both sides of the, the negotiation suggests thinks that there's going to be a deal. Okay. And do you welcome that, Matt? Is that what you would you want to see one? Or are you, are you, you know, no deal, let's sort of just get it done, clear, cut, end it, move on? No, I'd always rather there is a deal. I'd always rather there's business certainty, that there's a text that people are able to um, plan their businesses and their lives around rather than more uncertainty added on to a pandemic. Um, and, but it has to be, obviously it has to be seen by uh, parliamentarians. It has to be scrutinized and it has to be um, up to the standards. Um, I don't think that a no deal in this situation is the same as a no deal as it was last year um, because we already have the withdrawal agreement in place. And we have um, some other, some other agreements ad hoc in place as well. So um what it was, what, but I think that the, you know, a comprehensive agreement is in the interest of every party uh, to get done by the end of December. William, let me let me come to you. Um, the SDP back in the day was formed by a split from Labour because the Labour Party, in part, because the Labour Party was so hostile to the common market then the EEC. My understanding is that you guys now were on the Brexit side. You, yep. you welcome uh, the UK leaving the EU. 
Um, on what terms do you want to see us leave? Do you think we should just sort of, let's get it over with, leave on WTO terms and then sort of build our relationship with the EU from the floor up? Or can we still construct a relationship from the ceiling downwards? I'd be perfectly content to leave on WTO terms. Um, I think from the start, um, ever since we voted to leave, I think the EU's strategic um, position is misaligned to ours. I think they want and almost must see it fail. I think the uh, they've never wished it well, obviously, as a project. And so the negotiations have been a little bit of a farce. Um, as to whether we will get a deal, I think we will. I think it, largely because uh, Johnson's pretty much caved in, government's caved in at, at the final hurdle every single time. Um, and so that's what will happen. And actually, I think the currency markets have priced that in. If you look, I mean, the pound is very, very stable. So they, I don't see that uh, showing any um, uh, tension. I think we probably will get a deal. But I, I have to say that I may upset a few people at the IEA, but I... As a party, we uh, are looking for a softer globalism. We, I, I'm not worried about some trade friction. I think uh, some trade friction for the UK might actually help us deal with um, the two chronic problems we have, uh, which no government's been able to deal with, basically, which is that uh, you know, imports are over 30% of GDP and manufacturing is down at 12%. And manufacturing has to get up. And imports uh, probably should should come down a little bit. So a little bit of trade friction probably uh, in the next few years, I think, is probably necessary and desirable. Interesting. And, and therefore, it, what would you optimally like to see? A kind of thin deal with the EU? You know, let's sort of all, all of the sort of, you know, apocalyptic stuff about, you know, we don't want aeroplanes falling out of the sky. That will all be sorted. But yeah. would you like a slim deal? You know, a few sides of paper that just keep the show on the road? rather than a more comprehensive agreement? Or would your preference actually just be, let's call it a day? I mean, it's now been, I'm told, 1,301 days since mm. negotiations started. I mean, and it's not obvious what progress they've made, and there's only a few days left. So would you prefer to just sort of cut our losses, let's at least have the certainty of the terms we're leaving on, or still get some sort of thin, slim deal over the line? I think it's probably, as you described, a thin deal. Probably what, what Australia has. I mean, they don't have a full FTA. Uh, but as I say, I'm not. I'm not actually convinced that you want an FTA. I mean, I, I, I um, it's the same with the states. I wouldn't be jumping into an FTA with the states. We we now enjoy uh, quite a substantial trade surplus for the Americans. Um, I think the best metaphor for this is is just to look at the single market, which is if you if you have if you get into a boxing ring with uh, Germany and its, its supply lines and, and other countries near it, you're gonna deindustrialize pretty quickly. And the, the Spanish and the Italians and the French are finding that out every single year. And I think we need to have a look. I think we're probably, and the pandemic is probably bringing this along, but we are probably at a high watermark of global free trade now. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think, uh, I think we need to, to, to understand that there's got to be an end of indifference to what is made where and by whom. And I think, um, so our, our position actually is probably a pretty classic Peter Shaw center left position, which is a little bit of trade friction, industrial policy uh, and ad adapting, and also in particular getting the, the uh, policy levers. Because there's no point in leaving the EU if you don't get, if the UK government doesn't get its hands on the policy levers. And that's, what, that's why I think a WTO just leave is probably better. Steve, I want to come back to you. Uh, William uh, noted that what he was saying would, you know, cause, you know, friction at the IA. This isn't the IA line at all. Um, I agree. I think that's the case. Uh, but as the scrupulously neutral host, uh, I will back to you as my IA colleague to uh, give the riposte, Steve. It, it, what would you like to happen? And, and what do you think of William's points that actually you know, perhaps we've had a bit too much globalisation and free trade. Why do we want more of it? Um, manufacturing on the floor, huge balance of payments, deficit, uh, another example of living beyond our means. Give me the classical liberal riposte to that, Steve Davies. Uh, it, there's two, two things to say to that. First of all, um, there's nothing particularly special about manufacturing jobs. Uh, you know, it's not the case, I would say, that manufacturing jobs are somehow more virtuous 
than jobs of any other kind. The thing that matters, as far as the worker is concerned, is that you're doing something which adds value for other people and you get an income from it. It doesn't matter whether that's in a factory or in services or anything else. And the other thing is that the idea that imports are a sign of weakness is simply, well, historically untrue and also contradicts economics because essentially uh, imports are what you want to have. Exports are actually the price that you have to pay in order to get imports because what you want to do is to consume stuff that other people sell to you. The problem is you've got to give them something in exchange or borrow money from somebody to get it. Now, uh, you know, there are obviously long standing problems in the you know, UK economy and economic management. Uh, but the idea that we're, you know, the solution is to go back to the kind of economic policies that Peter Shaw and uh, other people in the Labour Party were advocating in the 70s and 80s, I think it's just completely wrong. And would, would, you know, we'd come unstuck pretty quickly as well, given our geographical and other location. Um, you know, it did say, it, it sounds plausible if you think of a country as being like a single business, but that's actually not the correct analogy. Uh, but what about the, uh, the uh, are we going to hell in a handcart, Steve, on the you know, if you if you build something, you can export it. You can the the, the argument goes: you can you can build a car, you can build a widget, you can sell it abroad. Pretty hard to sell a haircut abroad, um, uh, or you know, a, a, a cocktail or whatever else. And a service industry uh, based economy therefore leads to a colossal balance of payments deficit. You were all cutting each other's hair and buying German cars. Is that a problem? Well, yeah, but see, that, that's simply false. I mean, because in fact, the British economy has you know had an enormous surplus to services for well over 100 years. Because of course, in addition to the kind of services you describe, which are mm. not tradable, they don't go long distance, there's all the services like financial services, insurance, uh, law, a whole range of other ones like that, which uh, Britain sells very successfully all over the world. We're one of the leading countries in that regard, and we have been for a very long time. I mean, this is not new. People forget just how important services have been for the British economy since really before World War One. So there's nothing new in this. Right, I think let's see. Uh, the service economy, of course, is, is very important, but I take exception about the fact that manufacturing jobs are the same as everything else, because you know, manufacturing is known to have a much bigger multiplier effect on the rest of the economy than any other sector. And that's because, of course, all manufactured goods have to be transported, they have to be financed, they have to be advertised. All the rest of the things that come with manufacturing means it's a very much more important sector than just the 12% that um, was, um, was, uh, was pointed at, at the very beginning. But in terms of the Brexit thing, I, th I think you're right enough. You know, we, we, we don't need a massively... Um, important deal, but I think a Canada-style deal is, is, on, is, is available. It's always been really available. I think, I think we, should, we, should, we should be able to get that. And I think um, if we do get that, knowing that we've got a huge surplus with the rest of the world where we, where we trade on WTO terms, I don't think there's a problem in terms of um, trading with the EU under those conditions. Okay, well, in terms of our brilliant service sector, high-tech economy, our tech gurus I've managed to get Ali Renderson back online. Hey. So, Ali, we, uh, Ali, we lost you. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for joining us. We lost you after the word first. So, you were going to make <laughs> right. So, I know you were going to make at least one point. Mm. What you what you will have missed was us talking about a where we think this is going to end up, sort of deal or no deal or a thin deal, and where we would like it to end up. Uh, two different questions. What are your what are your takes on that? And I can't work out whether these talks are over or intensifying. I'm as confused about this as I'm about COVID regulations. Well, I mean, and I think that's actually one of the biggest issues for people who are affected by the change um, at the end of the day, really, is that, you know, uh, it helps them tune out. It's a bit like the COVID effect, only the more drama there is in the negotiations, the more the people who are trying to actually adapt to it are going to have an issue at the end of the day. And that's what actually, you know, I think we talk about deal and no deal, at least we're talking deal and no deal, unlike the reference to the Australia style arrangements, which I think sometimes get conflated. It's not a deal. It's sort of a, I wouldn't even call it a patchwork. There's one or two mutual recognition agreements on sort of um, uh, sort of um, how we basically do our sort of science, but not even our science regulations. So the question that I have there is that, you know, why, and I've had this question since the beginning, why are we comparing anything to an area where we've had that continuity, not we expect that continuity to keep going. But for example, I heard one of your other sort of panelists talk about, um, you know, uh, w whether it's in reference to manufacturing or services, why do we need it at all? Well, 
are we trying to, I think the, the issue with this debate has been too much of the baby out with the bathwater. We've had no discussion about where does it even make sense to carry on aligning? Where is it that we don't see the need to have to recreate an industry that we don't currently have as a regulatory standpoint? So I take, for example, chemicals in that, in that standpoint. Um, it's not that we can't regulate ourselves, but chemicals is probably one of the most highly regulated, highly traded. It's one of the few sectors I've seen where there's not a single SME who has any intention to want to diverge from the UK EU reach regulations. Yes, they acknowledge that once upon a time they couldn't stand them, but now it's more about, I think, you know, are you trying to amplify the effects of COVID? Or are you trying to mitigate them? You know, we, we have the data showing, and I think there's been this narrative that's spun out there that actually the impact of COVID is going to minimize the impact of no deal and or vice versa. Well, we decided to test that with our own members of the IOD, and, and I think less than one in 10 thought it was gonna have any kind of mitigating, minimizing effect. And the last thing I would say on that is that, you know, I think the issue here is the absolutism, you know, in terms of the deal that we're going to get um, for all that people, I think sometimes even in the trade policy side, unwisely poo poo the importance of tariffs. The difference between an entire massive market that you've had complete continuity of free trade with, whether you call it free trade or not, the point is there's been no barriers really to trade for the last 40 years. Um, do you care about any of that continuity or not? Um, if you don't, fine, but that's going to amplify the impact um, at the end of the year. And I think we're seeing the impact of the restrictions as they're added. It's making it a lot harder for businesses to uh, to tune in, so to speak. And so I think, you know, we're, we're teeing up for this potential blame game. You know, if it goes all, um, I, I won't use the word I should, but if it all goes pie in the sky, whose responsibility is that? Well, at the moment, you know, there is this inherent tension, I think, that the government has between on the one hand, whether it's for a negotiating tactic or not, wants to lift up the opportunities or the um, positivity of what, uh, whether they call it no deal or not, could, could, could um, achieve. And then there's the other tension where, well, that's just going to make people tune out and not help them get ready. So there's a lot of kind of conflicting yep. narratives going on here. Okay. Well, listen, we've uh, we've had a slightly pessimistic uh, or more pessimistic than the last time number from Tim. I wanted to inject a little bit of optimism into this discussion. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to talk to former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, who came in here to the IA, and of course, he's now working as a uh, as a trade envoy for the DIT. And I'm just going to play a clip on the YouTube side at the moment. I should warn our panelists, they're not going to be able to hear it. So I'm going to be able to, I'm going to have to pre-see it for you after our YouTube viewers have heard it. But Tony Abbott suggested that we needed to be much more upbeat, us POMs, than we were being. So I'm hoping that we can play the Tony Abbott short clip from yesterday's IEA webinar just about now. No country on earth has made more contribution to the modern world than this one. Uh, when you think of the mother of parliaments, the world's common language, the industrial revolution, the emancipation of minorities, the soft power of this country is immense. Uh, and the hard power of this country economically and militarily is still very considerable. So don't sell yourselves. So uh, for the benefit of our guests, our panelists who couldn't hear that, we can only broadcast that through YouTube. Uh, Abbott, uh, Tony Abbott was saying that we should be upbeat, we should be optimistic. The UK is a great country. I mean, there wasn't it wasn't detailed statistics, but we we had a huge amount of soft power around the world. We still had quite a lot of economic power and genuine hard power around the world uh, that we could be a lot more optimistic and should be a bit more gung ho about it. And he, he didn't quite say this, but I inferred it, that we were sort of talking ourselves into a sort of bit of a state of, of misery. Um, I, I want to, Matt, whether you think that we have lost our mojo here. It said sometimes of the prime minister. But uh, again, this is anecdote, not data. I was talking to some Americans who admittedly were enthusiastic for Brexit. But their view was this would be the equivalent of us after the 4th of July, 1776, sort of saying, oh, it's all going to be very difficult to get a trade deal with Canada and Mexico now. But we, we weren't sort of treating our independence remotely, seriously in a psychological way. What do you think of that, Matt? Well, I, I wouldn't use 1776 as a, as a great sort of starting date because America's GDP was pretty, um, pretty rocky for a few decades after independence. Um, and obviously, the end of you know there was the, the war in eighteen twelve that didn't quite go the right way. Uh, but after, but I mean, I do I do side with the sort of the idea that we are very pessimistic as a country. Um, we do like to uh, always think the worst of ourselves. We do like to always think the worst um, of any situation. 
And I think that, you know, I do think that there's going to be a deal. I do think that there are some good deals coming down the pipeline uh, with Australia, with New Zealand, an enhanced deal with Canada, maybe one with Singapore and accession to the T uh, CPTPP. Um, and then obviously there's America as well. Now, these don't necessarily all make up for the change that is going to happen, but the pandemic also causes some change. I think what we really need to make sure, though, is that the domestic situation is that we don't end up with a government that wants to constantly put its hand on levers to try and guide and control the economy. But as we leave a pandemic situation, that we allow that creative destruction process to retake control and, and therefore allow the efficient allocation of resources. <clears throat> it will be... It'll be a question of what happened after World War II. Do we do a Clement Attlee style planned economy or do we go for the German style um, released economy and therefore go for growth again? Yep. Interesting. William, let me come back to you. you. You were sounding, well, I don't know whether it's necessarily upbeat, but sort of fairly relaxed about the terms on which we could, we, we could leave. Do you think that we um, need to be a bit more optimistic about what the future brings, whether it's your more social democratic trade friction model or Steve's more libertarian model, but we've talked ourselves into all of this um, um, being a headache, a problem to solve, a conundrum, all on that side, which indeed it is in large part, but it's also an opportunity. Do you think we've got that sort of balance wrong, William? Yeah, I think we're, we're um, too pessimistic and we have been uh, for, 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 for a long time, actually. Um, I think the I think the effects of the pandemic and the I mean I think the pandemic could end up costing a trillion. I mean, I, I'm, you know, the National Audit Office have the government part of the that equation at uh, you know 250 billion now, and that we're just at the start really. I think that's going to get worse. I think the um, I think a lot of people are mistaking a, a rebound in the summer for recovery. So I don't think I don't think we're into a proper recovery really until we know where we are. Which is why I argued for policy stability. That's what that's what people need. You need to at least be able to <laughs> plan where you are. But in the long term, I don't think uh, the country's uh, welfare and prosperity depend on any single deal with any single entity. I think it's largely what we do and the policy choices we we, we put into action here. Um, and I'm optimistic in general. I think there's going to it's going to be very very choppy in the next 24 months. But if you put it out to sort of three or four years, I'll, I'd give you a six or a seven. Mark, could I come in on that? Just quickly? Sure. I mean, for me, this is classic, you know, um, it sounds like such a sound bite, but I don't understand what's wrong with the approach to this of minimize the risks so you can maximize opportunities. And I know that sounds like a sound bite, but why would you want to, in terms of, I, I think the people who do um, tend to want to leave on whatever you want to call it, no deal, WTO terms, um, are doing that because they want to lean on the levers. The question is, is that are you leaning on the levers for their own sake? Or is it you genuinely want to affect change? Now, I think there are people in number 10 who genuinely want to affect change. I'm just not sure there, for example, I remember reading in the um, Conservative Party manifesto when it came out before the election that they, the reason for uh, an example that they gave to scrap um, uh, EU state aid and just generally state aid rules, it seems at the moment, any kind of restrictions on subsidy is to, for example, institute a, a buy British policy. And I think they had related that back to agricultural support. I mean, the irony being that of all things that I think the agricultural sector um, whether it's connected to Brexit or not, that was the last thing they were asking for. Um, so for me, this is, you know, how do you actually do that in a way that actually, there seems to be this general sentiment that business as a whole is too negative about Brexit. It's more about trying to make sure you do it at transition period right. You know, it's so standard. I, if we talk about standard. I know the government uses the term standard FTA and other people do. A, we are asking in certain areas for more than standard. I won't go into the detail of that. But B, and this is where I think, you know, there are limits to how much you can compare this kind of current negotiation setup, which is not negativity. It's just trying to, like, get to the other side so that you can take advantage of whatever opportunities there are in a kind of measured way and actually not have to spend the time firefighting because of no deal, so to speak. So I think that's an important dimension for people to remember that it's just it's trying. It's how you do it. You know, if you if you were to go down the path of comparing it like for like, if you think that you can do that with, let's say, um, the U.S. doing a deal with anyone else, there is not a status quo period to rely and fall back on. Um, and even if you were to make that comparison, most FTAs, um, with or without a deadline, you know, they leave time for businesses to react, adjust, sure. even to things like tariff phase outs. That's normal. We haven't even allowed ourselves to do that. Uh, okay. Yeah, noted. I, I, I just want to finish on Brexit by asking about the 
the intervention of five Anglican bishops warning in a letter to the FT on Tuesday that the internal market bill would set a disastrous precedent, undermine Britain's standing in the world, potentially put peace in Northern Ireland at risk. The Archbishop of Canterbury, York, Wales and Amar, as well as the Primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church. Uh, this was with regard to the uh, House of Lords debate. Steve Baker, a practicing Christian himself, has suggested that Boris might disestablish the C of E if clergy remain political and a parliamentary motion to sever ties might be needed. God bless the Archbishop, says Steve Baker, but I wish that they were better advised legally. Now it seems they've inadvertently sown division where they might have promoted unity. Um, Brian, is this a welcome intervention from civil society or, or do you think that our spiritual leaders are getting sort of into politics more than we might be comfortable with, Brian? I think it's about time we did have a secular state, actually. Um, we should move a little bit more towards the French system and uh, just not have an official um, religion at all. So I, I, and I don't think they've done themselves any favours by picking a few um, items out and um, sort of claiming from that that, uh, well, we are, we are all going to hell in a handcart. No, I, I mean, this, this, um, this internal market bill is being put through because of the difficulties and the problems that are associated with that withdrawal agreement that was mentioned earlier on. It is a constraint on us, and um, it is stopping us, I think, from, um, from getting the sort of deal that I think is available. So I think, you know, we do need to do something now to, to improve our chances of getting that deal. And I don't think the, um, the, the archbishops have, uh, have helped themselves here. And Brian, before I let you go, what's your optimism rating? This is your first time in the show. I joke that this is a highly, I aggregate everybody's numbers at the end of the show, highly market sensitive data about how optimistic my guests are feeling about the United Kingdom in two to three years time. I need an integer between naught and 10. 10 is close to utopia, bountiful, prosperous, free country, and naught is we've become North Korea. Well, <clears throat> I'm fairly optimistic about when COVID is over, and we are um, trading under some new arrangements. I think I think it'll be fine and we'll go somewhere. And I think on average, I think I'm, I'm optimistic. I think it's going to be somewhere between five and six because of the legacy now that we're going into it from. All of my guests do this. I ask for an integer and they give me something with a decimal point. Pick five or six. Five or six, Brian. Five. Five, okay. And William, thank you again for you joining us. What do you make of the uh, this spiritual intervention first? And then secondly, I think you were saying you might be around a six or seven. But again, if you could give me an integer, that would be terrific. Well, the spiritual thing, I mean, they've bishops have been political for a long time, haven't they? You go back into history. So um, and even even, you know, in the 80s, remember the Bishop of Durham always uh, chipping in. Um, I'm more concerned with the bishops being in the House of Lords, and I'm more concerned with the House of Lords. I think that needs abolishing. You need to reform uh, what is a, actually an absurd institution, really. I know they've got a lot of very good quality people in there, but we can do a hell of a lot better than that. You'd have it democratically elected? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, actually, we, we have a, 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 a proposal for a unicameral situation based on uh, an English parliament. Um, so it's, it's a little bit complicated. But, yeah, I think it certainly needs to be, you know, a democratic uh, chamber. Yeah. Uh, and, and in terms of your integer, I'll go for seven. Seven. OK, well, we're not doing too badly in these bleak, bad times. Brian William, thank you so much for joining us. Been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, we're going to Steve, Ali, and Matt. Please stay with us. Um, Thank you very much. On. Thank we're you. Going to move on. It's been, been a pleasure having you. We're going to move on to our um, uh, our final topic shortly. But I promise you the question, the quiz question, is how you make 100 quid. I'm doing my own fiscal stimulus, 100 quid of my own money, if you can answer this question. You will know earlier on the show the address that you need to email it to. And earlier on the show, the head, the subject heading you need to put in the email. And I said it would be a mathematical question, and it is a mathematical question. It's a question about sport. It's a question about snooker. The question is, how many different ways are there to get a break of exactly seven in snooker? How many different ways are there to score a break of seven in the game of snooker. And I'll give you a clue. It is a lot more than most of you will think. So in order to win 100 quid of my hard earned cash, you need to email the email address we put up earlier. You need to put the subject heading that we put up earlier and you need to give me an answer. How many different ways can you score a break of seven in the game of snooker? 
Only one entry per person. You must have a UK bank account. You must identify yourself. All of that's in the T's and C's. Don't think that you can start emailing me uh, a million times with a million different numbers. But how many ways can you get a break of seven in snooker? That is the question. Email me with the right subject heading and the right answer, and you'll have 100 quid of my cash. Uh, let's move on to the last topic, Generation Why Bother, we might call them. Uh, a new report from the University of Cambridge says that millennials in democracies throughout the world are more disillusioned than any young generation in living memory. Does this pose a threat to the free society? What do we make of uh, our youngsters and our younger people? Let me just give you some of the, the details of the, uh, of, of the report. The poll was about a poll of nearly 5 million people worldwide, apparently. Millennials, I'm told, count as people born between 1981 and 1996, which I can't still understand, but that's what the, uh, that's what the internet tells me. The survey suggests that disillusionment is caused by higher debts, lower odds of owning a home, challenges starting a family, and reliance on inherited wealth to succeed. Uh, the report also found that 41% of millennials believe you can tell if a person is good or bad if you know their politics. Uh, this may also increase for Generation Z. Those are apparently people born between 95 and 2012, but not part of this poll, uh, with social media driving people into their own political bubbles. On average, those aged 18 to 34 reported a 16 point increase in satisfaction with democracy during the first term in office of a popular leader, where moderate politicians beat a populist rival. Uh, researchers found no increase. Following last week's beheading in France, Marine Le Pen's reemerge, found to shut down borders, calling for wartime legislation in a press conference. I'm tying an awful lot of things together here, but to help me uh, sort them out, and uh, sorry for the delay in getting on the shows, guys, uh, a warm welcome back to Cindy Yu from The Spectator, broadcast editor, China reporter at The Spectator. She was born and raised in China until the age of 10, read politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford University, where she also read for a Master of Science in Contemporary Chinese Studies, frequent commenter on China issues for RTE, the BBC World Service, and World TV. Cindy, welcome back to the show. Good evening. Wonderful to have you with us. Good evening. Thanks, Mark. And uh, our very own Emma Revel, Head of Public Affairs here at the IEA. Emma previously worked at the Centre of Policy, for Policy Studies and prior to working in Westminster, she spent three years working in development for a not-for-profit social care organisation. Her latest article for Con Home focuses on intergenerational in inequality, where she asks, are the political advocates for young people? Good evening to you, Emma. Hi, Mark. Uh, so, Cindy, let me start with you. Should I... Should somebody long in the tooth like me, well into my late forties now, should how, how worry how much should I be worried about you youngsters going um, going mad? Um, uh, what do you make of this poll? And even if you haven't gone through the details of this poll, what do you make of attitudes amongst the millennials more generally, Cindy? Well, I have to say, Mark, it's kind of you to invite me, but I don't think I'm really representative of millennials if I'm sitting here at quarter past seven on a Wednesday night talking to you. So in my friendship group, I haven't noticed this disillusionment so much. They're normally politically engaged, even if unfortunately they are or were Corbynistas. Um, but the poll is a poll and it's more scientific than my anecdotal evidence. So I think it comes down to housing, at least in this country. You know, we've got the housing crisis that's you know never probably been so bad. The Resolution Foundation two years ago found that up to a third of millennials will never own their own homes, up to a third. So that's a significant chunk of people less fortunate than myself and my friends to be polit politically engaged and probably in white collar jobs. Uh, so if you're not capitalist, if you're not buying into the system, then why would you think that democracy is working for you? And we know that Brexit comes from a lot of disillusionment, especially amongst older voters. So I don't see why a similar thing wouldn't be happening for younger voters who are not getting what they want in this part of the social contract as well. And Mark, what you said about the 41% who think that your political views can tell whether a person is good or bad. I think that's particularly interesting. And rather flippantly, I wonder if that's a bit of a Harry Potter effect, that the world is black and white, the sort of Manichaean view of morality, that, you know, unless you're left-wing or Corbynista or whatever it is, unless you're that, you're a good person. I think that's a, a huge shame that if, if that is true of my generation. Emma, what are you, what's your take on this? I mean, it's ever thus, isn't it, you know? As people like me get older and more gammony and more cynical, you know, we look at younger people and think they've got everything upside down and back to front. But what, what's your audit of the, the 
views of the young insofar as they can be aggregated together, Emma? I mean, um, I haven't read this study in great detail, but my understanding is this has compared uh, younger people now to their parents and grandparents at the same age and found that, yes, you can say, you know, young people are always disillusioned with government. They're never, you know, very well connected to the establishment and the system. But the, the change in people in this age bracket now compared to where their parents were at the same age is actually quite dramatic. So there is clearly something going on. Um, and what I would also say is, is what have young people got particularly to be happy about? You know, Cindy's quite right. Housing is far and away the biggest issue and, and it's caused a, a massive amount of disillusionment. But also, you know, particularly um, during this pandemic, people, young people's jobs are much more likely to be at risk. They're more likely to be in insecure work, um, in hospitality, retail sectors, for example, even people in more... Um, white collar professions they're early in their careers and they're missing out on massive opportunities by the fact that they've spent the last six months working from home and not in the building with senior colleagues you know I'm in the same position I'm at home now I'm not in the office with you or with Steve when he comes to London I don't so. know how you're coping Emma I don't I, know how you're coping a, I haven't seen you face to face that. hardly at all the last few <laughs> weeks or months I don't know how you're getting by <laughs> Look, I do. I'm making the best of it. I do pop into the office, but it's not the same as being there every day. And and on top of things like, you know, having to pay back the enormous amount of spending that's going on, you know, young people are really in a bind. And it does worry me, you know, kindly mentioned the con home piece I wrote, that there are advocates, uh, you know, pointing out the civil liberties implications of the coronavirus restrictions and, and pointing out, you know, admittedly that the spending is going to be, have to be paid for. But at a time when we are effectively locking university students in their in their dorms as freshers in new cities, uh, having, you know, just very recently basically completely undermined their A-level results, it's no wonder they're not happy. Matt, let me come back to you because you you guys at the ASI do an absolute tremendous job, uh, absolutely brilliant job. We 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 hope to replicate that here at the IA as well in reaching out to young people, students, uh, introducing them to um, uh, classical liberal thinking and economics. What do you make of this uh, this poll? I guess, but Generation Z more generally, you know, I've given a very old, long in the tooth kind of gamony analysis that sort of everybody, you know, between the ages of 18 and 25 is some enviro crazed socialist. And, you know, I sort of roll my eyes at them. Do you, what, what do you make of it? And is this poll cause for concern or just flotsam and jetsam? Well, firstly, some of the best outreach we do to young people, we do with the OEA. So um, I'll let you take some credit. Oh, mutual loving. That's what I like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the, the, you know, it's fundamental is that I, I still very much believe in the words of Margaret Mead that you, it's all, it, you only need a small committed group of, of individuals to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, and actually building up the next generation of thought leaders, uh, people who want to get involved in public policy, um, is much more important than going sort of spread bet. Um, because the spread bets over like how we choose and make decisions in democracies are like very different depending on what it is, right? If it's very detailed policy, we have a parliament that decides. And so the target of who you're trying to talk to changes. If you're trying to talk about who should like what the what the alignment of um positions should be more generally in society so that they make they they vote once every five years. Um, then you're talking to people on a different time scale, different ways, and to different groups. So it doesn't necessarily matter that young people want to nationalise the trains um, when there are other like other things for them to be talking about. And if I would again say housing is obviously the big one where I think like we haven't failed to mismatch the ambition of um, uh, of, the, of the political parties to the, the crisis that's unfolding before them. And in fact, I would say um, considering it is Black History Month and also because it is. Uh, you know, race relations have been in the news in the past few months. Um, I would say housing it really is a racial issue in the UK. We have probably have um, a huge amount of people who will inherit wealth um, and who lots of my friends, millennials of my age, um, have uh, that, you know, they're, they're not that worried that they don't own a home yet because they know that their parents own a home and that they'll inherit that home. They'll be able to either live in that home or use that home as a deposit. But there's a lot of people who are from sort of black and ethnic minority backgrounds who will never be able to own a home. Their parents are renters, they're locked out. And we're creating a real risk of structural racial issue um, in the UK. And that's my that's one of my big ones. But I think, you know, a lot of the issues that were coming down the track, the big ones, I think, you know, let's talk about Scotland for a second. 
Um, all the like the, the Scottish independence movement thinks that they've got young people sewn up. Uh, they, you know, they support Scottish independence 73%, but that, that support is really soft, right? Because a lot of the things that they say that they like about uh, the SNP is that their internationalism is their non parochialism. But if you include that, if the same issues of Brexit start to arise, not being able to see your family, not being able to move, not being able to be a teacher in one country or the other, not being able uh, to have that sort of soft power that people and cultural power that people yeah. like you love to identify with, then um, it starts to unravel very quickly. Like young people's opinions can be very quickly changed by circumstance, um, whereas older people tend to be more set in their ways. So I would necessarily say, you know, opinion polls are just a snapshot in time, but they also reflect um, the sort of like way in which people think on different timescales. Ali, what's your take on the young? Uh, I, I, is the generation gap in political thinking now colossal? I mean, as big as previously, I don't know, class differentials have determined perhaps ideological or voting preferences. Do you think there's just, uh, do you think there's a marked difference in the younger generation and their ideological, philosophical view of the world? Or was it ever thus, Ali? I think it depends on how much longer and how the pandemic rolls. I mean, generally speaking, and, and I don't try and use Twitter polls with some of my followers because of the range of views as, as any kind of perfect, perfect snapshot, but I was very surprised and disappointed when I did a poll about you know a month or two ago asking, do people think after this period, um, people were going to be more supportive of state intervention or less? And it was vastly in favor of more. Um, I mean, I contrast that though, actually, you know, some people may be thinking about that in respect of um, support from the state rather than intervention and incursion by the state. But I was, to take a really sort of personal anecdote, you know, one of my closest friends has gone from, you know, being very apolitical slash Corbyn supporting uh, eight months ago to having read eight months of Peter Schiff and regurgitating that, you know, the state's going to take away um, or link sort of food stamps. So, so I think she slightly got America and UK confused. It's going to link food stamps to forced vaccination. So that to me was a real kind of wake up call of, oh my goodness, how many people are spending all of their time in lockdown really kind of reading whether you consider it um, crank stuff or not coming out with these kind of extreme views. And so I think until that point, I probably would have passed aside this kind of poll. I would have tossed to decide. Um, I also think that's easier for someone like myself to do because I'm I'm a millennial, but I'm in a weird situation where I live in Scotland for most of the time. I've got a nice house because my money goes further up there. Um, how much longer it depends on what happens with the independence referendum. If that happens, we'll see. But I think that actually where I was relaxed before with the pandemic and really relaxed into the first few months of it, I started to see that fraying happening. And it's really how is that going to be leveraged? Who is going to leverage it? Are we going to? It reminds me a little bit of the Brexit party catching fire. Um, uh, in the months before the election and the European elections, where suddenly this party came from nowhere. And I started to think, gosh, you know, the government, and even I would contend potentially the, the opposition, the Labour Party is very lucky we don't have an election right around the corner. We have devolved elections, sure. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, I, you know, I wonder how easy it would be to harness that Probably not if you're Nigel Farage, although I can see why he would be a natural bedfellow for the, the argument says, you know, we want more um, independence from the state because it's too much. Are, are they going to go, are the young people going to be pulled down the line of we want support from the state or we want the state to get out of our lives? And, and where I thought that was a sure bet before, I, I'm not so sure anymore. Cindy, what you were saying that the, the circles you move in are atypical, good for you, but and obviously here on this show, even amongst the younger folk, we're, we're talking to very successful people who've got their own careers. But do you think there's a do you think there's a danger in the UK or the Western world at the moment, or perhaps even globally, that the, the average young person doesn't feel they have the same stake in society? Matt's already mentioned the housing ladder. Obviously, the the impact of the COVID restrictions, I guess, disproportionately hit the young. For people at university at the moment, have had absolutely miserable freshers' term. Um, do you think that there's a problem that younger folk, uh, perhaps the millennials, perhaps Generation Z, just don't have the same stake in society that I might have had uh, 30 years ago when I was 18? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and I think I should just caveat by saying when I say I'm moving atypical circles, I don't mean it's because I'm particularly successful. It's just that this is a very political circle. Well, I said it for you. You didn't have to say it yourself. I said it for you. <laughs> no, no. So, so, so that people are obviously going to be more politically engaged and not the 40% uh, the, the, the that we're talking about in this Cambridge poll. Um, but when it comes to the stake, you know, let's just take housing as an example, which has been mentioned a lot. 
the, the government is trying to get people onto the housing ladder through government schemes like help to buy and all this sort of stuff. And then something like the cladding scandal happens where you've got young people who finally saved up enough for a deposit for help, help to buy, which is, by the way, not entirely accessible. So it's a bit of a misnomer anyway. You get into these new, new bills and then the Housing Association and the government, who is a series of missteps and mistakes, uh, mean that you've got Grenfell cladding that you have to pay for yourself to get replaced. And until then, you can't sell your house. And this is something that we've been following quite a lot at The Spectator. So it seems like the system is not working for young people. And yes, I hear some of your viewers say, but what about the housing reform that's come in this year? Well, but even then, those Tory MPs are resisting uh, building in their leafy shires. So, you know, does anyone really have the uh, interests of the young in mind? I think Emma made a great point when it came to coronavirus. Um, not just university students having a bad time with it. What about those people just out of university? The estimates that a tenth of them will not have jobs. Uh, it's the most important time to get work experience. Um, and I can't imagine that many of them will be feeling very encouraged at this moment in time. Um, so politicians, I guess, frankly, need to be thinking more about young people, um, in, especially in this pandemic. Emma, a number of the references you made to uh, how things are bleak for young people were understandably and obviously related to you know present circumstances around lockdown measures. Do you think, therefore, it's transitory, Emma? I mean, I can appreciate that this is a you know a, a grimmer time to be young. You know, hard to go down the pub out for a restaurant, meet your work colleagues, etc. Hard to be active, which is what young people want to do. But is that transitory, or do you think there are some underlying problems here, COVID or no COVID, Emma? I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, you know, we can hope that that COVID, uh, you know, isn't with us for very long, but the impacts of COVID are obviously going to be, especially when it comes to, to government spending. And even if, you know, the impact on your career is only, you know, for 12, 18 months, it's going to be with you it's going to have a knock on impact for the rest of your career. So uh, knocking people, knocking young people back a little bit at this stage is going to hold them back for a long time. That said, obviously, you know, this didn't start with COVID, you know, um, especially if, if we're looking at millennials, you say people born after 1985, you know, if you're born in 85, you're 35. It, it, we're not just looking at sort of teenagers and freshers in university. These, you know, um, I mean, when, when my mum was that age, she was married with two kids. I was already eight, I think, when she was 35. So it, it's it's people um, having long term impacts. And this this began with the financial crisis, you know, uh, and probably before then as well. But it, it's not just a COVID thing. COVID is probably going to make it worse, not better. Um, one thing I would just like to add, though, is I think there are certainly dangers of a whole generation of people losing faith in democracy. Of course, there are, you know, you're more likely to turn to populism. And I don't think that's something I particularly want to happen. I, I really don't want young people to be disillusioned with the entire system and think, well, why? Let's not bother. But I think a little bit of um, not having quite so much faith in government is a good thing. Because I think it will tell young people that government is not the answer to all of your problems. In fact, it's the cause of quite a lot of them. And if we come out of this with, you know, a rise in populism and a rise in, you know, maybe we'll create a generation of libertarians instead of a generation of populists. So, you know, I, well, I'm, I don't I'm think it's likely. It. I think it's possible. And if it happens to, you know, 10 percent of young people, well, I'll, I'll take that. I'd, I'd wonder really quickly, Mark, whether there was a poll, interesting poll I saw, and I'm curious to know where young people slash millennials come out of this. Right before I um, decided that I'd had enough and didn't didn't want to pay for the cost of the staycation in the Highlands and, and went off on a 20 pound flight to Venice in August for a week, which was great. And nobody really was talking about it much. They may be talking about it now. Um, there was a poll I saw that was really interesting. That's uh, basically for all that I think that Britain, people in Britain have complained about the um, Europeans either being sort of too risk averse or too precautionary. They were looking, they were figures that were basically out saying that while the ratio of concern between public health and the economy was 80% uh, public health concern and 20% the economy in the UK, it was literally the opposite way around in the continental countries. And that was certainly borne out by the attitudes I saw when I was there. And just bringing you back to the UK, I just wonder where young people fat factor into that. Is that just the older people speaking or is that where they are too? Steve, you've. Uh, I'd like your take on this. We're, we're the long in the two people left on this call. You've written a lot about political realignment. When I was at university, it was sort of taught as 
uh, as almost a science that the, the big divide in British politics was class and pretty much class alone. Uh, religion and um, region didn't really uh, amount to a great deal. Is is the new divide generational? Is that now one of the major cleavages in how people think about politics and society? Uh, well, yes, but no, uh, in the sense that it appears to be age-related, but I think that's actually a proxy for something else, which is whether or not you've been to university. Uh, and be- the really big divide, I think, in politics at the moment is between people who are qualified through university degrees to enter into the labour market in a certain way um, and those who have not been to university and who therefore are not in part of that labour market. Uh, Mentioning also that the people of the first kind who've got a degree and are in the meritocratic labour market are increasingly disappointed with the payback that they're getting, as Emma mentioned. Uh, And so I think that's what it is. It's not age as such, it's more the degree to which uh, you become part of higher education. But as as you said, as I said, I'm a bit long in the tooth. I mean, in some ways, this all strikes me as very familiar because I can remember all the talk about how disillusioned and alienated Mm. youth were in the 1960s. Uh, Although I think a lot of that alienation came from the prospect in the United States of having your draft number come up and be sent off to fight for Uncle Sam in Southeast Asia, Uh, but the which would disillusion anybody, I would think. But the the thing is that these kind of things do happen recurringly, um, and each time it happens, there's a particular reason why the young people feel that the old folks are not up to the job. And I, I agree with what everybody said. I think the big issue at the moment is housing, uh, not least because if you can't buy a house, and not even just any old house, but a house of a certain size, it's very very difficult to have a family. And Establishing a family is a crucial part of, uh, you know, movement through life. And currently, the housing system we have, not just in Britain either, but in many countries, makes that very, very difficult. Matt, let me come back to you for your final thoughts. Uh, is it planning reform, which you guys at the ASI and us at the IEA have been banging the drum on for some time? Yeah. Is that as close to a silver bullet as we get to get people a, a, a real foothold and a stake in society? Um, is that the route? Would that then? Would a lot of the other stuff then, if you like, come? You know, come good if people we could find a way in which people could get on the housing ladder. And then, Matt, I've got to ask you how optimistic you're feeling on the live with Littlewood, naught uh, to ten integer. The answer to your first one is yes, and um, the second one is I usually come on here and give an eight because I'm optimistic, but um, I've just watched a first minister impose a border on the Isle of Great Britain for the first time in um, several hundred years. So I'm not exactly happy about that. Um, and on top of that, I'm watching the Chancellor or the Bank of England suggest that they're not going to keep loose monetary policy. So that's a terrible mistake. Uh, and I'm watching the Chancellor wrangle with whether to provide support for businesses for the next few months, which looks like it's going down. So we're going to end up with more mass firm failure and cascading credit risk. So my pessimism scale is about three or four today. Yeah. Again, give me an integer. Three, three. To be with it's three, miserable. Three, three, it's it. rubbish. It's been raining all day. It's rubbish. It's raining all day. Okay, you're, you're dragging down the average. Lovely to have you with us, uh, <laughs> Matt. Cindy, let me come back to you uh, on uh, optimism and the way forward. Obviously, times are pretty bleak at the moment, but my, uh, I'm looking for a number that will, that will sum up your optimism over the next two or three years. A 10 is uh, absolutely everything will be wonderful, bountiful, prosperous. Everybody will be happy, wealthy, healthy and free. A naught is that we've become North Korea. Where do you think we're going? What's, and give me some grounds for it. Are you feeling optimistic or not? And a two or three year time horizon, not a two or three day or two or three weeks. Right, two or three year time horizon. I'm feeling six, I'm going to say. Are you happy with that integer? I'm, I'm, you've at least given me a single number. And, I've you know, learned that's gonna, so from six. The other I'm, I'm not saying I'm happy with it, but it makes my maths easier for sure. So thank you. And why a six? Um, I think in two or three years' time, we will have, and I feel like I'm jinxing myself now, so I'm touch wood. In two or three years, uh, hopefully coronavirus will be behind us. Of course, the economic impact is going to hit us. But surely within three years, things will be better. I mean, it's a bit of a hunch, I have to say, economically. I I mean, Um, obviously, there's this problem of printing money. uh, And maybe there'll be reckoning to that. But nobody really knows if it's going to happen. So if it's, you know, as the IMF says, that actually the world is not going to have to pay as much 
as we think we will when it comes to um, coronavirus, then maybe that then that would be good. Our cover story this week on The Spectator is about how China has uh, excelled in all of this, you know, Chinese growth in the, in the last quarter is 4.9%. Um, so that's net growth. And, and that means that obviously it's slower than usual, but at least it's not a recession. So, you know, for me, worst comes to worst, I'll move to China. And you think in two or three years' time, Cindy, we won't just have made back the losses that, you know, the economic losses and the freedom losses that we've had in the last, we'll, we'll be better than we were in February 2020, right? February 2020, I'm trying to think back to that distant BC time. Um, you know, when you could do normal stuff. <laughs> God, I would, yeah, I would absolutely hope that by this time next year, things will back, be back to normal in terms of how we are living our lives. Obviously, the economic damage will be longer term. But my point about China was a bit flippant. But w- the more serious point is that if the Chinese economy is good, at least that means there won't be a global recession in the long term. Relying on China to superpower the economy again. Cindy, it's been lovely to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you for your six. Steve, what's your number? How optimistic or pessimistic are you feeling? Uh, It's the same as Cindy's, and it's the one I gave earlier, which is six. Six. Uh, For the same reasons as Cindy? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think things are going to be pretty rough in the next year, 18 months. But I think by the time we get to three years, uh, we'll be on the way back out of it. And Ali? Uh, how are you feeling? Two or three years, let's not worry about the next two or three weeks, two or three months, let's assume we can solve all of that. Uh, Ali, how are you feeling in, you know, this time in 2023? Uh, how will things be looking? Uh, what's your optimism on a scale of naught to 10? I hate to give you two numbers, but I'm going to, it was a seven until I saw that poll saying that the British public was 80% worried more worried about public health and therefore supportive of restrictions in the economy so that put me down to a five i'm afraid one poll has knocked two off your score <laughs> that that's the sort of flaky generation snowflake stuff i've been complaining about well, if, it doesn't, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't worry you i'm worried for you mark <laughs> <laughs> I, I i feel a bit lionel shriver i'm i i had a little bit more faith in the british people until i saw that poll i think we're uh, switching switching roles with our caricature of europe at the moment and Emma, the last number goes to you, and then I've got to do a bit of complex uh, division. Ali, thanks for your, well, it's not really pessimistic of five, but no, thanks for joining us and thanks for overcoming the tech problems. A, a, a nice round, easy five, but down from a seven. Uh, Emma, what about you? Where are you at? I'll give you the number first so you can do the maths while I explain why. Thank you, one. thank you, thank you. Uh, most... I'm going to go with a four. Right. Uh, I think I was previously a lot more optimistic, but it really worries me that people, you know, don't seem to be paying attention to to how we're going to pay for this, um, how we get out of it. The only bit of optimism I do have is that uh, I think people, uh, you know, on the ground outside Westminster, uh, people's willingness to put up with these restrictions is waning. And I think it's waning fast, especially among young people. But I think of all ages, you know, pensioners do not want to be locked in their homes. Young people do not want to have their social lives taken away from them. So I think the fight back will start, but I'm, I think it's going to be slow and I think it's going to be painful. So I'm going to stick with a four. A four. You, you've made my maths very easy. I'm, I'm myself, I'm going to pick a three. Uh, I am, I, I've usually gone middle of the road, but if I pick a three, that brings the aggregate total to 45, which is pretty easy to divide by nine, uh, which means we come out at an aggregate five middle of the road uh, this week. Um, thank you all of you for joining us and for all of your thoughts. Thanks to my previous guests, Tim, Brian, uh, William. Thanks to Matt, Cindy, Steve, Ali and Emma. It's been great having you on the show. If you're feeling a little bit pessimistic, don't be too downhearted. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show, please remember to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get updates about our latest videos. Special thanks to our donors. If you've got uh, any money that you can spare in these difficult times, please go to the iea.org.uk website and make a donation. And my reminder uh, for those of you still watching live or if you want to hit the rewind button, the first person, I should highlight that, I've been reminded by this, is not everyone who gets the answer right. It's the first person who gets the answer right. Otherwise, if you're really smart, I could go bust. The first person who finds the correct email address, we gave that out at the start of the show, 
the correct subject heading, we gave that out towards the middle of the show, and can answer that complex snooker question, how many different ways can you get a break of seven in the game of snooker? The first person will get 100 quid of my hard-earned cash, but you will need to email us by five o'clock next Thursday at the absolute latest, if anyone can get it right. I think the 100 quid is pretty safe in my wallet. And it isn't all doom or gloom across the world. It's no great surprise, I guess, that companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Apple have seen uh, sales surge since lockdown. But this is one that might have escaped your attention. This quarter, Durex announced their condom sales are up 13% year on year. So on that note, stay safe, stay free, over and out.